Hello and welcome everybody to another Thursday evening program with the Genealogy Center. I am very excited for our speaker today, Tina Beard, who will be talking about Scotland's resources, something that I wish I knew more about for my own research. So I'm very excited for her presentation this evening. Tina Beard, she's the owner of Tamarack. I assume I'm pronouncing that correctly. Genealogy. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and she is the local genealogy, uh, well, the genealogy slash local histor history librarian at the Plainfield Public Library. So she lecture, lectures extensively on military research, Scottish records, which is why we're all here, and archival preservation. She has a phenomenal background. She's been researching her own family for over 25 years. She's the first vice president of the Illinois State Geological Society. And she's on the board. She's a board director for the Oswego Land Heritage Association. So I'm very excited for her program. And I'm going to stop your Mary at you. So I'm going to disappear and let her get started. But just as a final reminder, use the chat for chatting and use the Q&A for questions. So Tina, I'm going to let you get started. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. And thank you, everybody, for being on tonight. Um, I was looking at the chat and at the attendees and seeing a whole lot of Scottish surnames. So I'm delighted to see so many McMahons and McDonald's and Foresters and um, Smiths on. So it's exciting for me to see so many of you interested in Scottish research. Now, what I'm going to talk about today is records by types of collections. So we're going to cover a little bit of everything just simply because it's such a large topic. There is absolutely no way that I could talk about every single resource that exists on the topic. So I'm going to give you some of the most popular and even some of these like in the weeds research sites that you might not have ever heard of. So for those of you who've been researching your Scottish families for quite a while, hopefully there's going to be something new in there. Um, that you haven't utilized in the past. So we'll definitely talk a little bit about vital records, wills and probates, um, because I cannot talk about Scottish records without talking about um, Scotland's people. So we're going to touch on those two topics in relation to that website. But then we're also going to talk about things like taxation records, criminal records, largely immigration and emigration records, military records, and then maps. And then at the very end, I'm going to talk about social media sites and some crowdsourcing resources that you could take advantage of, local archives, national archives, and so on and so forth. All of the links that I'm going to talk about today are going to be in your handout. There's only going to be one that is not, and I'm gonna point that out to you. So if you wanna do a screenshot or if you wanna jot it down, you are more than welcome um, to do that. As I was telling Elizabeth, I had just given this presentation recently and then went back and checked my links this afternoon and found that there were two dead links, unfortunately. Um, I, corrected, I corrected everything else, but there's one um, that I had enough time to put in the, in the webinar, but not necessarily enough time to put in the handout. Um, and that happens to be right here on this first page. It's the Scotsman's um, newspaper surname map. So if you want to take a screenshot of this page, you are welcome to, or jot down that bit.ly link. It'll take you right to the map. So for those of you just starting out and you know that you have a Scottish surname, but you don't exactly know where in Scotland um, the surname might happen to exist, there are some resources that are out there for you to kind of help push you into a generalized um, area of the country. So this map, while I realize appears very tiny on your screen, kind of shows you an idea of the types of surnames that you're going to see. So in the lowlands, you're going to think get things like Ferguson's and Douglas's and Graham's and Scott's and Craig's. When you start to get up into the Highlands, you're going to get things like the Max, the McDonald's, the McKenzie's, um, the McIntyre's, the McLean's. And then you kind of see there are some that are just going to be scattered all over the country. You're going to get Campbell's everywhere. You're going to get Smith's everywhere. Um, but it's a good representation of um, the smattering of surnames across across Scotland. Um, a good place to start, I like to use John Grenham, and I'm going to talk about him in more de detail in, in just a second. Um, it's an Irish website, but a lot of us have Scots that went to Ireland. We have a lot of Scots-Irish in our, in our research, and John Grenham's site is a really good example of how to find variations of surnames. So I myself had 
Karens who went from Scotland to Ireland before they came to the United States. I can go into John Granham's website and put in Karens, the spelling that we know it to be, which is K-A-R-I-N-S. That's the spelling here in the States, in New York. Um, and it shows me all of the variations of Karens. So I can go and use those variations both in Ireland and Scotland. So I really like John Granham, even though it's an Irish site, to kind of push me um, to, to place names and surnames in Scotland. Again, the Scotsman newspaper has a really good surname map that you have access to as well to kind of figure out where on earth would this surname be most typically found. I'm going to talk in a lot more detail um, about immigration and emigration for Scottish records, but some places to kind of start you on that path would be someplace like the National Library of Scotland has a really good website on emigration. The National Records Office of Scotland, the NRS, which is like our National Archives in Washington, D.C., um, has a good collection on how to do em uh, research emigration records and immigration people who went back and forth. University of Aberdeen, you're going to hear me talk about them again later on, has an absolutely fantastic index, um, searchable index that you could use to trace your Scots who left Scotland. Immigrant Ships is another website. So all of these are in your handout. You don't have to jot them down other than that very first um, Scotsman's surname map. Um, but just to kind of give you an idea, think about where your family lived, wherever it is they landed, whether it's in Canada, whether it's in the United States, whether it's in New Zealand or Australia, Think about the towns and the place names, the Scottish place names that are in those locations. A lot of times those are the exact same places where those families were coming from in Scotland. So, for example, here in Illinois, we have the town of Elgin. Obviously, it would be Elgin in Scotland. Um, other places like Gretna, New York, Air, Nebraska. There are a lot of places where those families who are leaving their home are bringing that place name location to found a city of the same name. Um, in their new in their new location. So for example, for me, Tamarack is a brand new name um, because it was derived from Tamarack trees that were bought brought by a Scottish family to the Scottish settlement. And it had been called the Scottish settlement here in Northern Illinois for about a decade until this family, the Burnett family, brought those Tamarack trees. So it received its name Tamarack because of the trees. That's not always the case. A lot of times they're using the place names from where they came from. There were two other Scottish settlements in Illinois about that time, and one of them was called Argyle, which was largely made of made up of people who were fleeing Argyle, who were coming through Campbelltown um, to Northern Ireland and then from Northern Ireland um, to the States. So if you've got those place names in your family tree here, that's a very good indication that the potential is that, is that they brought that name with them when they arrived in the country. Cemeteries are also another good resource. I don't spend time on that in this particular presentation, um, but a lot of times if you can find that first or second generation to the United States or wherever they were going, whether it's Canada or New Zealand, they're putting the place locations right on the headstones when the family is being buried in the local Scottish church. So sometimes you can glean that directly off of the headstone as well. But there are lots of reasons why people are leaving Scotland. People are leaving in the 1820s because they're being forced out because they're considered undesirables um, by the British government. So people are being um, forced to leave because of either poverty or mental illness or um, criminality. A lot of people are being forced out and supported, I will say that loosely, supported by um, aid societies like the Paisley Aid Society, the Glasgow Aid Society. A lot of those were coming to Canada in the 1820s. So if you had family who arrived in Canada in the 1820s and 1830s, that's probably the reason. Um, you had a lot of people who were pushed out into Pennsylvania and New Jersey in the the British colonies here in, before the United States um, who were covenanters that had raised arms against the British government um, in the 1680s. So a lot of people who came into um, what eventually would be the United States, the, the eastern seaboard in that time period, were coming because of religious persecution. Same thing with the clearances. Um, a lot of people were being forced out of the highlands um, for supporting Bonnie Prince Charlie. So if you know the reason why your ancestors were fleeing Scotland, we'll give you a pretty good indication of where they were going to land. Because in those periods, they were taking the predominant number of um, expats. 
So like I said, Canada was getting them in the 1820s. Pennsylvania and New Jersey was getting them in the 1680s. The Carolinas were getting them in the 1840s. So if you know where they landed and why they landed, it'll help fill in that information. If you don't know any of that, if you have a very common surname, if you're struggling to figure out, you know, how can I get past grandpa? Scottish naming conventions are a really, really, really good way to do that. And they give you several websites in your handout that explain what Scottish naming conventions are and what they do. And I've seen in my own families that I've been researching, it could be three, four, even five generations here in the United States, and they're still following that Scottish naming convention. So it's a really, really good resource for figuring out who mom and dad are, who older brothers and sisters are, who extended family members are, because they give specific names to children based on their birth order. So for example, the firstborn son is going to be named after the paternal grandfather, dad's dad. The firstborn daughter is going to be named after mom's mom. Second born daughter is going to be named after dad's mom. Second born son is going to be named after, you know, mom's dad. And they're going to follow that down. Third born child is usually after an older sibling. Fourth child is usually after the parents themselves. So fourth boy or fourth girl would be mom or dad's name. And they really follow this very strictly. Now it gets really complicated. I do a lot of research on the Craig family. <laughs> And, you know, John who has James, who has John, who has James, you know, and then they have Mary, Martha, Mary, Martha, Mary, Martha. It can be extremely confusing. Um, but if you've hit that brick wall and you're stuck and you can't get further back from that person, looking at how they named their own children and then using those names to put them into this conventional pattern. Okay, who's the second born daughter? Who's the first born son? And before you know it, you've got mom's parents' names, and you've got dad's parents' names. Um, so that's always a starting point. We're going to start with these, the names of these as the parents, and we're going to see if, if that unlocks the code, if that opens the door. So Scottish naming conventions are really, really important. So I highly recommend you look at a couple of these sites that I give you to kind of Build a roster for yourself to see if that plays out in your own family. There's always going to be an outlier. There's always going to be a black sheep who chooses to not name their first child after dad. And there's usually a pretty good reason for that. Um, so knowing a little bit, if you have the luxury about your family history, might explain why they might not have done that. But typically, it would be very, you know, very reliable for those first couple of generations. When you're dealing with Scotland, a lot of people never had middle names. So the further back you get, you're just going to get John Campbell, James Craig, you know, Mary Smith. And that could be really complicated in your research. Um, it's not until you start to get into the Victorian era, until you get into the 1840s and later, where you, where you start seeing middle names for children. Sometimes it's the maiden name of the a woman in the mother's family, very rarely is it ever mom's maiden name. It's usually like mom's mother's maiden name or some other female line of the family. Very rarely is it ever um, the maiden name of the mother. Um, sometimes they're named after recent family members who had just passed away. They give them that middle name. Sometimes it's after the minister themselves. If they had a very family, had a very strong connection with their church, a lot of people chose to use the middle name um, from the pastor's name as well. So you want to look into those kinds of things. Um, if you've been doing Scottish research, you know that Jane and Jesse and Jenny are all the same thing. So you just want to try to figure out what kind of nicknames or diminutives they might have used. Were they using Gaelic um, if they were from you know, central to northern Scotland, were they using Morag instead of Sarah or Alistair instead of Alexander? Um, so you want to remember that you can use either or, so you want to check. A lot of times you'll see, you know, you'll see Jesse listed um, for Jane. So just knowing what the nicknames could possibly be for that particular forename could be really useful to you. So there's a site on there in your handout to help you kind of figure out what those are. Here in the States, we're pretty familiar with things like Jim for James and Peggy for Margaret, um, but this will go into more detail about some of those that might seem unfamiliar to you. Briefly, very briefly, I just want to point out some additional resources that you have in your handout for those of you who have Scots-Irish ancestors. I mentioned John Granham. I want to talk about him for just a minute. If you go to the John Granham website, you're allowed to do a couple of searches before they want you to pay for access. 
go in and clear your cache, erase your cookies, or use a different browser. And if you don't get enough surname searches in um, before you do that, or go into Google and go into um, a secure browsing mode, um, that'll also help um, keep that from happening, um, especially if you have a lot of surnames. But what I like about John Grenham is it, it creates a heat map for you. So it tells me that Fahey is most popular in Sligo, and this is how many families have that surname. Or Campbell is most popular in Down, and here's how many people are going to have that surname. So it kind of gives you a heat map of where the surname's most common. But then again, like I said, it's going to give you that roster of additional ways to spell that particular surname. So that might open up some new avenues for you as well. I'm not going to talk about the rest of these sites. You've got them in your handout. They're just here as a reference for you. Um, so for those of you who had family who did a two-life lease, they came to from Scotland to Ireland, stayed for two generations, and then moved on, here are some good resources to help you kind of dig a little deeper into that as well. Here's that John Grenham heat map that I was talking about. You know, here's the Karen's name in my particular family. It tells me there's only three people with the surname spelling as I'm familiar with it, but then gives me all of these additional places and tells me where. There's several in Dublin. There's only one in Cavan, and actually Cavan is where my family comes from. So that really helped. Um, Mayo, Wicklow, Meath, it's kind of showing all those to me. So it provides something very similar for you if you did a search on your surnames. Okay, Scotland's People has a lot of resources available in it, but it's a subscription site. You have to pay to gain access to original content. You can use the indexes for free. So if you have not signed up for an account through Scotland's People, I highly recommend that you do. It does not cost you anything to sign up, but if you, you can search records, you can search the indexes for free. But if you want to view an original record, if you want to view an original digital image, you would have to buy credits. And it's usually anywhere from six credits to 10 credits, depending on the type of, of image you want to purchase. 10 for wills, six for vital records. Um, but you can absolutely 100% search the indexes at no cost. So I can go in and I could take those, those supposed, those hopefully um, names of, of the birth parents and see if there is a couple that matches those two surnames, John and Agnes, you know, Matthew and Mary, and see if it comes up. Um, if you want to view the record, you could either pay for the record through Scotland's People, or I'm going to give you a couple of other suggestions where you can look for that as well. But there are some records in Scotland's People that I cannot get access to the original digital images anywhere else. Um, those are going to be things like wills and probates. Those are going to be things like um, valuation rules, which I'm going to talk about in just a second. But I like to use the index for Scotland's people to search the original church records and search the statutory records. So in Scotland, the church was responsible for keeping track of birth marriages and deaths up until 18, 1855. In 1855, it became the job of the government to keep track of those records. So when you're doing your Scottish research, you're going to see OPR listed a lot, and those are the original parochial registers. Those are the vital records that the church, the state church of Scotland kept. So while Presbyterian is the national religion of Scotland, there are a lot of variations. There were many schisms in Presbyterian at, over the course of several centuries. So what is considered the established church um, isn't always the place where your ancestral records are going to be recorded. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Um, but the the church records would be the place to go pre-1855 if I'm looking for any of those vital events. So Catholic church records are available. There's a smattering of those available on Scotland's people that I have access to. I have access to the OPRs, which are the established church. That's the, the, the government church. But then Scotland's people also digitized what under the collection of other churches would be schism churches. So that's things like free churches, relief churches. That would be things like burger, anti-burger. That'd be like new licked and old licked. Um, United Presbyterian churches, which are what free churches eventually became. So there's a lot of different types of Presbyterian churches outside of the quote-unquote established, the established church. So when you search the OPR, it's searching specifically for those established church records. So if you come up empty, definitely make sure you change your search box to other churches and look in some of these schism churches, especially in the lowlands. 
you know, in the 19th century, probably 60% of churchgoers were members of free churches or relief churches in that time period. So I have family that are in Ayrshire, that are in Renfrewshire, that are in Lanarkshire. They all show up in these other church records because they had broken away from the established church, which to them was a little bit too liberal. They were quite conservative. The free churches are, are very conservative. Um, so a lot of those people who were covenanters in the 17th century joined the free church. So there's going to be a difference in the types of records that are collected there. The established church was responsible for recording all deaths in Scotland, not just Presbyterian. So sometimes you'll find Catholics listed in the death registers. Um, sometimes you'll find um, Latter-day Saints. Sometimes you'll find, you know, Jewish records all listed because the established church was responsible for burials. So if you're striking out and your family's not Presbyterian, still look in these records for burials. They could be really insightful. Statutory records after 1855 are the civil registration. So that's the records that the government is keeping. Um, so that's where they're asking for maiden name of, of mother. That's what they're asking for occupation of father. Um, so a little bit more detail than what you're going to get from the OPR records. Um, but I can absolutely 100% go into the OPR and do a search in the index for my surnames and for my people without having to pay to view the original records. So what I would do is I would take that index, I would do my search, and then I would go into a site like Family Search and go into the catalog and look for the microfilm reels for that particular church. If those are already available, either scanned already online or if they're available through an affiliate library, I'm gonna take the information out of the index on Scotland's people. I'm gonna plug the date, I'm gonna plug the name. Sometimes it'll even tell you the page number. I'm going to go in, I'm going to pull up that microfilm reel, and I'm going to find it in another source. There's one thing that Scots pride themselves on is being stubborn and being cheap, and I am both, so I'm not going to pay for a record if I know that I can find it somewhere else. Um, so there are some other sites in there as well, like Ayrshire Roots and some other places where you can get access to the vital records, but truly family search is, is really the best. So I use them in tandem in that way. But things I cannot get anywhere else are things like the valuation rules. So if you had a family member in Scotland who owned or rented property, um, the downside to renters is that they had to have paid over four pounds for their property. And most people didn't even come close to that. So my poor tenant farmers who are living on another farm working for the farmer never paid that amount of money in rent. So they do not show up in the valuation rules. But if you had somebody who was a businessman, if they were a bonnet maker, if they were a weaver, if they were a, a carpet manufacturer, um, if they were a milliner, they probably were paying four pounds because they were paying for the shop as well as their own property. Um, so they'll show up in those types of records. And it tells you who the owner of the property is, who the tenant is, the value for the property, and they give you a brief description. So it might be, you know, office and garden, it might be home and garden, it might be um, shop and um, carriage house, and it'll tell you exactly what they were renting and how much it was worth. In Scotland's people, they only did the fives. So I can see 1855, 60, 65, 70, but they did do them every year. So at the NRS, at the records office in, in Edinburgh, you do have access to every single year. Um, Scotland's people just has every fifth year available to you. Um, so they are available digitized through Scotland's People's. You, uh, you can search them and you can buy a copy of it. Um, they are not online anywhere else, but just remember that there are more years than just the years they have there. Another thing I cannot get anywhere else are wills and testaments. Um, so if I wanna see property, both movable and unmovable property um, that somebody might've left. So that might be the animals and, and the household goods um, or the property itself, that's the difference between wills and testaments, um, would be um, available for you to download through Scotland's people. Um, they're 10 credits a piece. They're not cheap, but if you did have family that owned property and left it um, to their descendants, this is really the only place you're going to be able to go and have access to those. So you do have that as a resource through Scotland's people as well. But I want to move on a little bit and I want to talk about some other sites. So while the census is available through Scotland's people, you can access it, through, access it through other sites. You get a bit of it in Ancestry. You get a bit of it through um, Find My Past. You get a bit of it through 
family search, um, but each one of those kind of silos the data. So if I go into family search and I search the 1861 census for Andrew Craig, it's not going to show me the entire household. Same thing with some of the searches in Ancestry um, or some other sites. Find My Past is a little different, but um, if I if I go into Ancestry, it's not I'm not looking at the original image, so I'm not looking at the page to see what other connections are available to me. Really, Scotland's Peoples is the only place where I can go and make that connection together. Um, now, censuses, as you can see here on the screen, do not record the same information. There are some big gaps in that information. So really, they're only available from 1841 going forwards. Um, before that, they were largely head counts, and a lot of those records were destroyed. They no longer exist. But the beauty of UK censuses is that they did them on one day. Everybody knew that they had to be home to be available for the census taker. Unlike the US census, which could take months at a time, and you had the likelihood that people would be recorded more than once in more than one location. Um, the census in the UK is really reliable um, based on the fact that they did them all in one evening. So the information you find in there is important, um, but they do make some adjustments. So like I say here, when you're looking at the 1841 and 1851 census, they had a tendency to round the ages of adults. So if somebody's 23, they're going to round it to 25. If they're 22, they're going to round it down to 20. So don't assume that you're not looking at the right person um, because they just, for ease of use, they just round it up. But kids' ages are usually pretty accurate. So if it says for the child that the child is seven, the child's most likely seven. They didn't adjust children's ages. They really just round it up for adults. So keep that in mind when you're looking at these records, especially if you're looking at one of those collections that's siloed, like Family Search or Ancestry, that it could be the right person because you can't see the full page. You might have to push back to Scotland's people and pay for the credit to access it. Scotland's Places is one of my favorite sites. This is really predominantly where I'm going to go for tax information and for maps. Um, they have a fantastic website that is now free. It used, used to have to pay quarterly for access to Scotland's Places, but they opened it up at the beginning of COVID and made it accessible to everybody. So it's a very good snapshot in time for the end of the 18th century. So when Scotland was taxing people on how many carriages they had, how many windows they had, the number of servants that they employed. Um, those records from roughly about 1790 um, to a little after 1800 can be a really good window into where your family is and what their socioeconomic status is. I use the male and female servant taxes a lot to find my people, not because they were the ones that were paying servants, but because they were the servants. So I can find some of those people like my farmhands and my um, scullery maids are listed in these records as working as being the employee of a landlord of some kind or a wealthy farmer. So these are great resources for finding both people who owned their own property as well as people who were employed by those people. So it's a good site to use. Um, largely, the taxes were phased out by 1800. There's a smattering of them that take place after that. But really, this is just a fantastic window into the end of the 18th century. But they have an absolutely fantastic maps collection. So while I'm going to talk at the end about all of the different places where you can access Scottish maps, Scotland's Places is one of those. And they have what are called the Ordnance Surveys and the Name Books. So the surveys are great. The maps are fantastic. The Name Books are equally important, especially if you're just starting out. So if you've used the Ordnance Surveys to find that farm name or to find that neighborhood or that... Um, uh, bonnet makers shop. That's great. But what you need to do is go back and take a look at the name books because it gives you a description of the community, tells you what churches were in that community. So again, remember there were so many schisms in the Presbyterian church that this is a good place to find out what the name of those free church, those, you know, relief churches were called. So then I can go looking for those records. Um, it's a great place to find out how communities changed, how the size grew, what the names of the schools were, or the school teacher, who the minister was to find out if that's where the name came from. It also gives you a description of the properties, which is absolutely fascinating. So you can see if the farm they're working on is well-kept and well-maintained or whether it's 
starting to be run down and buildings are in disrepair. Gives you, again, that socioeconomic information. It's great to have names. It's great to understand the conditions in which they were living in. And that might explain why somebody chooses to leave Scotland for another destination. So make sure that you're looking at these name books as well. I'm going to show you an example of one in just a second. They have a couple of gazetteers and directories in there. They have the 1892 counties and parishes, which again is really, really useful. I use it in tandem with the Atlas of Scot Scottish History in 1707, because when the countries unified in 1707, they went around and they created this atlas of all of the places in Scotland. So I can see, again, the churches, the school, everything about this community, and then compare it to what the 1892 counties and parishes book is telling me, as well as those ordinance surveys in between. So I can see how a town grows or decreases throughout these surveys. Here's an example of one. My family is from Finnick. Um, so I can see a little bit about the parish of Finnick. It tells me about the sheriff. It tells me a little bit about the church, the size of the congregation. It gives me just a very brief history about it. Um, and then references other points. So it tells me that if you read Peterson's History of Air, it's going to talk about this particular community. Here's how things have changed and gives just a brief description on the updates to the community since the last survey was done. Really, really important to help you understand what the town was like and what the individual farms were like. So I can go in it and I can look up Wraithburn Farm or I can look up Hillis Hill or I can look up Greystone No and see what kind of condition those farms are in and a little bit of information about who the proprietor is and who the tenants are. So again, if this is your family, it's really insightful to find out those details. Here are those ordnance survey maps that you could see they're done in a 1 16th scale. So I can see the town of Finnick had multiple churches. So not only did they have the established church, but they also had a free church in town as well. Down in the bottom corner, UP Church, that's the United Presbyterian Church. Like I said, the free church merged into and formed the UP Church. So the ex the established church is where the graveyard is because they were the ones that were, were responsible for burials. But the UP church does not have a cemetery, a burial ground associated with it. And I could click through and I can see how the community evolves over time. So I can see in this earlier record, it's still listed as United Free Church. It's not listed as United Presbyterian Church yet. I get a better view of the established church in the manse and the the local businesses, homes, and farms surrounding the community. So really gives you a very good snapshot of what the community looks like over a number of years. So let's talk about criminal records. Everybody thinks that their ancestors never did anything to wind up um, before the court of law. This is absolutely 100% not true. Or maybe it's just my family. They seem to be seem to be in trouble a lot. But the things that we would think of in the United States in the 21st century are not the types of things um, we would think of as being um, criminal offenses that were, for example, small debt. You could be thrown in debtor's prison for owing less than a pound to a local business uh, or establishment. Um, things like poaching um, and then more severe kind uh, crimes like rioting and theft um, are all things that would come before the court, but they have several different types of courts that you need to be aware of. So you would have your criminal court, you would have your high court, those would be for high crimes. Um, so those would be um, crimes against the United Kingdom as well. So covenanters who raised arms against the British government would automatically have been tried in the high court of judiciary. Um, Sheriff's court would be smaller cases, things like assault and theft. Those are on a local level. Um, any debtor could be jailed um, for their debt up until 1880, until the laws changed. Um, those books are all available at the National Records Office in Edinburgh. But there's a really good collection of criminal records and workhouse records available through Find My Past. In your handout, I give you several links um, where you can go and dig deeper into criminal court records. Um, but a couple of things just that I want to point out about Find My Past records. One of the records collections that they have are called Hulk Re Records, H-U-L-K. We're not talking about, you know, the Marvel Universe. We're not talking about um, the Hulk. We're talking about 
boats. So when they talk about Hulk records, they're talking about people who have been arrested and are going to be charged down in London. So they were being held on board ship until they were brought down for their criminal trials um, in London. So when you see a Hulk record, it tells you that these are records you're not going to find in the local court. These are ones where you're going to have to go to Kew Garden to find out exactly what happened to these people. So again, these could be things like covenanters who were arrested, anybody who um, was charged with um, traitor sacks or sedition or anything like that against the, the British crown would show up in these Hulk records. So you'll see criminal court records and then you'll see Hulk records. That's what they mean when they talk about Hulk records. Franchise court again, small criminal cases, rioting, scandal, larceny. Um, Justice of the Peach, Peace handled things like prostitution, illegal fishing, poaching. So there's different courts. If you go to the National Records Service website in your handout, they give you a link that gives you a really good description of which courts are responsible for which kinds of records. Also in your handout is a link to the wiki page in FamilySearch to Scottish court records. So that's going to give you a lot of information about what the different types of courts handled, what they were responsible for, and where can I find the original records to take a look at. The little snippet that I have in the bottom right-hand corner for you is from the National Archives in, in Edinburgh from the NRS. I mean, I was specifically looking at um, debtors' records in AIR, in the county of Ayrshire. And when I saw Bard and Bess Collins, I actually laughed out loud to myself in the National Archives Records Research Room because I have to admit, I was a pretty big fan of Dark Shadows back in the day. So Barnabas Collins immediately caught my eye and gave me quite the chuckle. So if any of you recognize that name, you are vampire fans as well. So here's another example of those. This is a larger version of one of those sheriff's court records, those small debt books. And it tells you, you know, who the pursuers are. You know, the town of Kilmarnock is going after the following people for not paying, not paying their bills. So a lot of people show up in these records. Honest to goodness, a lot of people show up in these records. These original records are not digitized and available online just yet, um, but in the workhouse records, so these people who had to pay off their, their debt, who had to pay off the fine um, for not being able to pay for their shoes or for their, uh, for their goods, you might find them in those workhouse records that are available through Find My Past. Um, it's just going to be the index. You're not going to see the original page. Um, but just know that those original records are available through the NRS in Edinburgh. Again, I had Covenanters in my research. One of the collections I looked at while I was in Edinburgh at the National Records office um, were lists of bounties for the covenanters who were being sought by the British crown. And you can see the prices put on their heads. I mean, 20,000 pounds in 1680 is a tremendous amount of information, uh, uh, money that they're asking for, for some of these. And then they're telling you whether they were captured and what happened to them. The records for those who were caught and who were tried are available in Kew Garden in London. Lots of people were executed during the killing time in the 1680s for, for being covenanters, for being traitors to the British crown. Um, one of the families I researched, the Peyton family, Captain John Peyton was one of those who was executed in grass yards in Edinburgh. And if you ever go to um, Greyfriars Abbey, there's a huge monument and um, section of the cemetery for those covenanters who were held prisoner over winter until their trials. These are all in your handout. I'm not going to go through these, but these are those guides that are available through the National Archives to walk you through each of those record collections, whether they were criminal trials, whether they were debtors, whether they were justice of the peace records. This kind of walks you through that. The beauty of the National Archives website, so if you go into the NRS website, they have indexed their criminal court records. So I can search in the online catalog for um, the 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 defendant and for the, the prosecution and for the witnesses. So if somebody was a witness to the crime, they index those names as well. So I can go into the NRS catalog and search and see if I have family member that shows up in any of those categories, either as the defendant, as the prosecutor, or as the witness. So those are already indexed, even if the original trial is not. 
Some other places where you can look, again, I talked about those hope records that are available through Find My Past and through Ancestry um, UK edition. I don't know if the hope records are available through the US.com edition, but I do know they are available through the British collection, but you do have access to them through Find My Past. Again, Family Search Wiki is a wonderful resource to explain how court records work in Scotland and where you can find them. Another website that should be in your handout is Scottish Indexes. They have indexes to not only um, witch trials, uh, but they also have indexes to criminals as well as mining accidents and, and a whole lot of other additional resource resources. So Scottish Indexes is another really good site to go to look for criminal records. Again, just indexes. I'm not looking at original records, but at least it'll lead me in the right direction. So now let's talk about emigration and immigration records. There were lots of people who went back and forth, um, especially between Northern Ireland and Scotland. Um, so they might have moved to Northern Ireland, but still returned home to baptize their children. That is not unheard of, um, especially between Larne and, and Campbelltown. You'll have people going back and forth pretty regularly. Um, but if I'm looking for emigration records, I need to be aware that there are no records retained by the British government before 1890. So if I'm looking for things on Scottish emigration, or if I'm looking for things on UK emigration, I'm not going to find anything at the National Archives in Kew before 1890. But some other places where I can look to see if I can find that information, an absolute fabulous resource is Scots Abroad. Um, you have all of these links in your handout already. Uh, um, University of Aberdeen, which I talked about, which is a really good database. I'm going to show you a screenshot of that in just a second. Um, Find My Past has a decent emigration list. Um, Olive Tree Genealogy has some. I talked about immigrantships.net already. So there are places where you can go that have little bits and pieces of that puzzle. Now, depending on where they went in the world, depends on where I'm gonna to go to look for these records. So for example, if they're coming to Canada, I'm not going to necessarily look at Ellis Island or I'm not gonna look at Family Search for those Canadian records. I'm going to look at something like Scots to Canada. I'm gonna look at things like the, the Canadian National Archives or the individual communities. Um, the Ontario Library, the Montreal Library has records related to emigration to the individual provinces. Um, if they were people who went to South Africa, Australia, or New Zealand, Family Search has a fantastic collection of those records already digitized and available online. Um, so depending on where in the world they're going, it's going to gear me towards the type of collection I'm going to utilize. So for here in the States, I'm going to utilize Olive Tree Genealogy. I'm going to util utilize Ellis Island. Family Search took over Castle Garden. Um, so in your handout, you have a link um, that's going to take you to the Castle Garden Immigration blog page where I could do a search. Um, but the original website for Castle Garden has, um, has ended, has closed. So just keep that in mind if you had Castle Garden bookmarked previously that it's no longer a valid link. You're going to want to access it through Family Search. Um, Aberdeen has a really good collection specifically for Canada as well, so that's a site that you definitely want to take a look at. Um, some other places where I can go to look for that information, the Scottish Archive Network, it's affectionately known as SCAN, has a database of immigrants um, that have come from the Highlands as part of those um, aid societies. So you have the link in your handout. You could go to that research tool and you could do a search for people specifically who would left directly from the Highlands. Um, same thing, like I said, Family Search is a fantastic collection of those who were going to South Africa, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, really good resources that are available to you there. Here's that scan.org example for the Highlands. So it kind of shows me by family group. We have a whole lot of McDonald's who had left from the point of sleet. It tells me the name of the ship that they were on. It tells me the date of their departure, 1852. Tells me where they were leaving and where they were supposed to be arriving. So it tells me that their port of arrival was supposed to be Melbourne. Again, I see that we've got a lot of McDonald's who are leaving from Portree. You know, they originally started in um, Liverpool, and they were going to Geelong, and then tells me that there was a problem with this particular ship 
that once they reached their destination, the proprietor, the person who paid to ship them over to Canada, had just abandoned them and left all of these people to their own devices. And as you can see, you know, this is May 26, 1852. These people arrive in Canada without any type of provisions, no extra food, you know, no jobs, no place to live. Um, and gives you a little bit of information. So then you could go in and research a little bit more about that particular ship and find out what happened um, to those souls who were just abandoned. So it's a really fantastic database um, that I highly recommend that you utilize if you've never heard of it before. Um, hopefully you're gonna find some really great information about your family. These are the ones that are available through Family Search. These are those records where people were leaving for South Africa and New Zealand. Um, I had the Folds family who had gone um, from Scotland to South Africa um, at the turn of the 20th century, stayed there for a very short time, and then took the boat across from South Africa to New Zealand. And I've got the ship's manifests that are digitized and available and searchable through there. So if you had people who traveled to those destinations, really a wonderful place to go to look for those records. Military records are available in a number of different places, but something to keep in mind that pre-1707, when we had unification with Great Britain, the records are held at the National, Na National Records Office in Scotland. Um, so you could be commissioned in the Army as early as 1670. Um, when these records, when the country becomes unified in 1707, all military records then transfer to Kew Garden in London. So if you had somebody who served, you know, in the 19th century or in the 20th century. If they were in a local militia unit first, those records are going to be in Scotland. Um, but if they were federalized and if they became part of a British unit, those records are going to be in Kew Garden. So I give you some examples like the War Office, Admiralty, and the Royal Air Force records um, are available through the National Archives in Kew Garden. Um, but like I said, soldiers' wills are available through Scotland's people. So those records are free. If I'm looking for just general wills and testaments, I have to pay 10 credits. But if I had a soldier who was killed during the First World War, those records are available for free through Scotland's people. So anybody has access to those. But these military records live in those couple of different places. But the UK has done an absolutely fantastic job of making these records available digitally online. So not only can I purchase records directly through the National Archives in London, right through their catalog, but there are also other paid websites where I can access that information as well. So here I can show you that I was looking for James King, um, who had served in the 7th Regiment of Foot um, in, during the Crimean battles in the 1850s. Um, I can find the record for his unit. I can pull it up in the catalog for the National Archives, and then it tells me that I can buy a copy of his records directly through Find My Past. So all I have to do is click on the link, pay the five pounds, which comes out to like seven dollars and, and change, and then I instantly have a copy of his service record. I didn't have to go there to gain access to it. Same thing is true for Forces War Records. Now, Forces War Records just got bought out by Ancestry. Um, so I'm assuming we're going to start to see those collections pop up in Fold 3 in Ancestry in the near future. Um, but for right now, I can go in, create a free account with Forces War Records and do a search as well. So those same records that I found through Kew Garden, through the National Archives website that are available through Find My Pass. I also have access to those through Forces War Records as well. So here's my information. I've got James King, his service number that I, he was in the 7th Regiment of Foot that we're looking at 1854, and I can pay for and download a copy of his records. So they have done a phenomenal job of making records available, military records specifically available online. Um, so again, fantastic resource to go and look for additional information. Some other places to look if you had a soldier who was killed in the line of duty, Commonwealth War Graves Commission is very similar to the National Archives database of um, national cemeteries in the U.S. So I can go and look through there for a soldier. Find My Past, again, has their military records available. And then a free site is the Gen UKI. So it's the Genealogy for the United Kingdom. Um, has some military record indexes. I'm not looking at originals, but there are indexes available online for free through them. And then, of course, the Imperial War Museum in London also has some databases and some research tools that you can utilize to track your military ancestors as well. So let's go back to those maps and gazetteers quickly. I don't want to run over. I'm going to try really hard to stay on time. 
those of you who know me know that that is a tremendous challenge for me. So there are lots and lots and lots of places where maps and gazetteers exist for the UK and for Scotland particularly. One of my favorite maps to utilize is a vision of Britain because it allows me to put the modern day Google Street View map on top of the ordnance surveys and go back and forth between the two, between the modern and the historic survey. So I can see how a community, how a road, how um, farmland has changed over the centuries. Vision of Britain is a lot of fun, but other places where I can go, Internet Archive has a collection of records that come directly from the National Library. So what's beautiful about these is that they wanted to make them discoverable where people were. Not everybody was going to go to the National Library of Scotland and take a look at their digital map collection. So they put them in multiple places so that people could find them and discover them. And Internet Archive is one of those locations. So I have access to ordnance surveys. I have access to um, what we in the States would call city directories that they call postal directories in the UK. Those are available to you as well. I was able to use postal directories for Stewarton and for Glasgow and for um, Kilmarnock and Finnick all the way back into the 18th century. Um, so before I went, I looked up the families, got the place, the place locations of the families in Stewarton and these other places, and then was able to go there and take photos of those places. So it's beautiful that these are available for free in all of these different locations. Again, the National Library also has zoomable overlays of those same maps, just like a vision of Britain does. You also have access to them through the National Archives. You have access to them through um, Scotland's places. But here's an example of one of those. So here's one of the original ordnance surveys. So I'm looking at one of the historical maps and then I can go into Vision of Britain or into the National Library of Scotland and overlay the Google Street View map or the aerial view and see the difference between the two. So I can go back and forth and I can follow this road from Kilgrammy right in the center of my screen and I can follow it you know, directly through, um, through the community. So I can see how much this has built up since these ordinance surveys were created. And then here's one more that kind of shows you Main Street and then the road that curves along the river. So you could see those changes that occurred throughout the centuries. Oh, am I stuck in a loop now? There we go. Okay. So now some additional resources that I want you to be aware of. Again, these are all in your handout, so you don't need to write any of these down. If you want to work with a professional about tracing your Scottish genealogy, by all means, reach out to the Scottish Genealogical Society. Just like our National Genealogical Society here in the United States, we want to take advantage of the knowledge and the expertise that the Scottish Genealogical Society has. So you can easily reach out to them for more information and more assistance. I talked a little bit about Gen UKI, about the United Kingdom and Ireland genealogy. Again, these are all indexes. Everything on here is free. Everything is sponsored by volunteers. They have a variety of different types of records from census records to vital records to military records to church records. But again, they're just indexes and abstracts. We're not looking at original digital images. Those of you who have been researching Scottish records far enough, get back to the 16th century and realize that everything just looks like chicken scratch. And I have absolutely no idea what these church records are saying. Scottish handwriting website is a phenomenal resource because not only does it show you how Scottish handwriting evolves over the centuries, but you can also do little practice tests. I can download a sheet and I could try to transcribe it and see if I'm accurate. So really, really good, valuable resource for those of us as we're working back in our Scottish ancestry to be able to understand and read um, the acronyms and the handwritings and the, the proclivities that they used at the time period. Rampant Scotland is one of my favorite sites because it covers all aspects of Scotland and being Scottish. So whether you want to travel, whether you're interested in music, whether you're interested in Scottish dance or genealogy, it's all in there. Um, so it's a really fun site, um, especially if you're planning on going to Scotland, which I highly recommend. They've got some great tips on their site. Other places, Dictionary of Scots Language. So when somebody tells you to, you know, hold your wish, like I tell my children all the time, they understand that I'm telling them to shut their mouths, to just be quiet. Um, so great dictionary of Scots language. I enjoy it a lot. So if you're a fan of Outlander and you want to look up some of those terms that Jamie says um, to Claire all the time, they're going to be in the dictionary of Scots language. Don't ignore, don't 
um, underutilize local online resources. There are a lot of fantastic genealogical historical societies and libraries that are available to you throughout Scotland. Um, yes, it's great to go to the National Archives. It's wonderful to go to the National Library of Scotland, but actually reaching out in the communities where you're doing your research is the most important. So for example, I do a lot of Ayrshire research, so I've reached out to the Robbie Barron's um, center. I've reached out to the, the Dick Library, which is in East Ayrshire. Um, I've reached out to the Stewarton Public Library, a variety of different places. Each one of them, just like in your hometown, are going to have some aspect of that family story, whether it's photographs, whether it's letters, whether it's diaries, whether it's school records, and whatever it happens to be, you want to make sure that you're contacting them as well. A lot of them have really strong on online pre presences. Persher and Caithness is another one that has a really good presence online. The Highland Center um, in the Highlands is another fantastic resource that has a really strong online presence. The Fife Family History Center is another good one. Um, some of my favorite um, resources that I follow on social media, the Edinburgh City Archive, is phenomenal. Like I said, um, the Highland Family History Center um, is really, really good. Um, so depending on where you're doing your research, look for these organizations online. Take advantage of the things that they're posting, uh, the the webinars or lectures that they're, that they're promoting or highlighting, the databases and resources that they're making available to you remotely, because you might not have to go there to start your research. You might be able to start a lot of things here before you decide to head over. Really fantastic archives. Again, the SCAN network, you definitely want to take a look at the information that they have available. The National Archives of Scotland Archives Finder is another one of those two that I think is very underutilized. So what I love about SCAN and the National Archives of Scotland's Archives Finder is it, it puts it together in a stoplight fashion. So if a collection is readily available to the public and is accessible, it has a green dot next to it. If it's a collection that is in a public facility, but it's closed or restricted, it has a yellow dot next to it. And if it's a collection that's in a private home or in a private collection that is not accessible to the public, it has a red circle um, for stop, basically. But what I love is the fact that they took the time to go into private homes and collections and index the material that existed. So at least we know that it's there and that it exists. And then if we need to reach out and contact those individuals or reach out and contact those organizations, we have the ability to do that. Here in the States, I don't know if it's the same in Canada, but we don't know what lives in private collections or in people's homes and attics because nobody has done an index or a survey of those. National Archives of Scotland did, and it is priceless. Archives Hub is another really good resource for you as well. Like I said, I've used the Robbie Barron Center in Kilmarnock, which is another one of those family history organizational centers like the Highland Archives um, that happens to be available to you in your research. Don't ignore things like social media because a lot of times they'll post images, they'll crowdsource information. You can do the same thing. If you have a photo or if you have a letter that you can't quite read, you need somebody to help you translate. If you have a document that you need assistance with, you can post it on these organizations, Facebook pages and ask people for help or ask them for more information or send them a message that says, hey, I'm going to be in Fife. I'm gonna be staying for a couple of days. Where do you recommend? What, what food, you know, is available to me? What hours are you open? Or some of those organizations that may be closed to be able to reach out and say, hey, I'm going to be there. I see that you're not open on Saturday. Is there any possibility I could meet with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, you know, to, to talk about my family history? So reaching out through social media is absolutely a fantastic way to both share and receive information. And again, these are just snippets of the hundreds of sites that are out there. Flickr is a really great resource that's underutilized by genealogists. There are collections in there by the Scottish National Gallery, National Library, again, the National Trust for Scotland, which is what runs Scotland's places, Scottish Heritage. There are a lot of options out there. I'm just highlighting a few, and these are in your handout. So I'm actually going to turn my camera on so that Elizabeth can tell me any questions that you might have. So hi, everybody. Um, Pardon my my oh, Star no, Wars. No. Pardon my Star Wars figurines behind me. My son is painting his room, and he said, "Can I shove all my stuff in your office?" So. <laughs> George Lucas is Scottish, though, so there, it's all appropriate. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Okay, so there are a number of questions in here. Okay, let's see. Now, I'm going to preface this by saying, if we don't get to all of your questions, feel free to send us an email. Tina's email is in the handout. Mm -hmm. There's no need to panic. You know, we're librarians. We like to help people. So Absolutely. if we don't get your question, just send us an email. And if you like a copy of the chat, send us an email, which I did put in the chat a couple okay. of times. Okay. So the first question, this person was saying that their ancestor was born in Ireland, but then he moved to Scotland where his son was born. And she's like, how do I list that? I'm not sure what she means by list that. Like, kind of like Scots-Irish. Is it like Irish-Scots? I it, is it, be Irish. Is I mean, I mean, if he's born in Ireland, then he'd be Irish. Yeah. Um, you know, it depends. I'm assuming to Scottish parents, so it would probably still yeah. be Scots Irish because I'm assuming his parents were still Scottish. But that's not uncommon that people would go back and forth. That's yeah. really not unheard of. So sometimes they just bring all the kids back and register them at once in in the home church, um, and you might have seven kids or four kids listed all at the same time. So especially when you're looking at the OPR indexes online, um, if you're going through the microfilm on family search, always go to the last couple of pages because that's where they're doing the families. Yeah. So if they're doing individual babies, they're kind of in order. But if everybody's getting baptized at once because they're leaving for the States or for Canada, they're going to be in those last few pages and there'll be a whole page of family. Right, right. So um, yeah, somebody had said something very similar saying that uh, their people were from County Monaghan, but then spent generations in Scotland, in Glasgow mm -hmm. specifically, before returning to County Monaghan. So, as you said, it, it happened. Okay, let's see what else we have in here. My ancestors' names were Gordon and Barnum, B-A-R-H-A-M. I thought that was Scottish, but Irish? Is it Irish? Barnum, I don't know. Gordon, oh, Gordon, oh, Barnum. that's a tough one. I thought Barnum was English because it doesn't I think show it'd up be in John Graham's website. Yeah, like York. You know, I would think it'd be like Northern England, like right along that border there. Yeah. I don't know for certain. Check John Grenham's website. I love him. And all the variations too, because there could be, yeah. that could just be one variation of something else. Absolutely. Uh, this is an excellent question. So uh, one person had said that they volunteer and they have tra transcribed gravestones uh, for one particular genealogical society. And they were wondering if there are sites in Scotland that have done similar transcriptions and are they available? Deceased online is probably the most prevalent. Um, there, there is there is a finder grave in Scotland. And you'll see a bunch of my stuff posted in there, um, but probably deceased online is the largest, but it's not a free site. So you would you might be able to search it, but you might not be able to, to get access to everything. Um, but honest to goodness, family search, if you go into familysearch.org and you go to their books collection um, and look for cemetery indexes, you'll be shocked at how many Scottish ones that you actually find in there, where people did it in the late 19th century or the earliest 20th century where they did headstone readings, those stones don't even exist anymore now. Um, but Family Search did a, digitized a lot of those um, early cemetery readings. Okay, so a couple of people were asking about researching Craig, C-R-A-I-G yeah. or C-A-R-I-G-U-E. Um, one person was just like, is that what you said? Like, are, is Craig? Like, I think they're excited. And then another person said that their maiden name is Craig and they're like Scottish, Irish. Scottish, yeah. Scots, Irish. Um, if any of you, and I didn't put this in the handout because I didn't know if it would necessarily be useful or not, but if any of you follow the Guild of One Name Studies, um, it's, um, one, like O-N-E hyphen name. Um, dot org, I think. Um, so the Guild of One Name Studies basically takes one surname, somebody is responsible for it globally, and they research all of the families with that name. So Craig is one of those that's in there. Um, and you can reach out and contact, you can join, or you can reach out and contact that person who's responsible for the name, because they're the ones that keep track of that surname globally. So that's how you can make connections when you're when you're running into brick walls. I really love the Guild of One Name Studies. 
But yes, if you're researching critics and they're in Ayrshire, send me an email. <laughs> Great. Uh, we're going to do like two to three more questions. Is that okay? Oh, yeah. Great. Okay. Um, just because I know we are low on time, my friends. Uh, so speaking of names, this person said that it took them years to realize and then reconcile a difference in names between records that their third great-grandfather's name was recorded as Hugh, H-U-G-H, H-U-G-H, and then Ewan, E-W-A-N, and that they are the same person. Mm -hmm. um, he was wondering if there were any clues to help avoid this happening again going forward. Really? I mean, other than documenting it. So where there are websites where it's 2.0, where you can make comments and annotations, absolutely, by all means, do that. So whether it's Fold3, whether it's Find My Past, where you have the ability, or Family Search, where you have the ability in the tree to, to, to make an annotation that this is what it is. But really just, like I said, going to those sites that's showing me the diminutives and showing me the variations between English and Gaelic was really the only way I figured it out. So... Sadly, yeah. it's one of those yeah. hard lessons learned. Um, okay, so next question. My ancestors came first to Canada and then a generation later went to the United States. Was that common? That's fairly common, especially if they're up in the Thousand Lakes area in New York where that border is so close. And think about it, just how close the border is in general. There were a lot of people in that Thousand Islands um, location that just went back and forth between New York and Canada, just because it was more convenient. It's like people going from, um, Kentucky to Cincinnati because it's like, it's right there, right. Or, or Northern or Hammond, Indiana, to Chicago, because it's right there. So there's a lot of people who traveled back and forth. It's very common. Okay. So we're going to do one more one more. Now, I'm going to preface this by saying, if we did not get to your question, definitely send us an email. I'm going to put it in the chat again. And um, Tina's email is in the handout, which I'll put a link to that in the chat again as well. Okay. So this person was saying that they've gotten far back to, so they're Taggart's, aka Mac Taggart's, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. They were sent to Northern Ireland in the late 1600s. They were in the colonies, American colonies, uh, 1745, according to many descendants bios. Um, their particular ancestor was in 1755 uh, in North Carolina, fought in the American Revolution. But they are stuck in Northern Ireland. They want to oh. go back to Scotland. And they're like, how do I go in that era from Northern Ireland back to Scotland? Honest to goodness, I would probably start with the Ulster Foundation because the Ulster Foundation and a lot of those, like they've got, a, they've got a couple of free databases, but some of them are subscription databases. So if you can't get into a collection that you want to view, send me an email because I, I have a lifetime subscription to them. I can get in and take a look. But in Northern Ireland, Presbyterians were the only ones that were really literate because in one of the premier tenets of Presbyterianism is you need to be able to read the Bible to interpret the Bible, not to understand the Bible. So in the 15th, 16th, and 17th centuries, they were the only ones who were truly literate in mass, whereas with Catholic records, a lot of times it was the priest who was writing letters and, and reading letters for people. Um, so because of that, there are a lot of Presbyterian schools that existed in Northern Ireland. So for the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, um, and they have an index to some of those available through the Ulster Foundation. Um, Prony would be another choice too, but truly where I'm going to track them is probably going to be through the schools or through the Presbyterian churches. So at Prony, there's an index to Presbyterian churches, but the records are not digitized. So if you can narrow down to the individual parish, they can look through the records for you, but the school records through the Ulster Foundation should be. So between those two things, you should hopefully be able to make that connection. That's awesome. Well, thank you, Tina, for such a wonderful presentation. So jam-packed full of information. Um, somebody, a lot of people are very happy saying that this is the best presentation they've ever seen on the subject. So um, thank you again. Don't, and thank ooh, Don't say that to Paul Milner. We don't want to offend him. Paul's my mentor. 
He's, he's who I learned, learned everything from. So if you want to know more, watch any of Paul Milner's presentations. Um, but well, your you, presentation everybody. was great. Um, <laughs> I had a great time and everyone loved the Barnabas uh, reference. Yeah, a lot of people are very excited for Dark Shadows anyway. Uh, thanks okay. to everybody okay. for joining us. And I hope you all have a wonderful night. Just as a final reminder, if you need a copy of the chat, if you have more questions, send us an email. It's genealogy at acpl.info. All right. Have a good night. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Elizabeth. Have a great night.